For the poor, it's in there 36 a year, and our Lutheran church has been a part of that for about 20 years. I'm one of 12 Missouri Synod Lutheran pastors who are assigned anywhere in the United States. And as Pastor said, we, my wife and I just uh, moved into a uh, community, a retirement community in Germantown, so it's not much more than an hour drive, but yet with the weather last night, I chose to be uh, safe and sure, and of course to be here in East Troy at any time is just a privilege for me. But we have here this morning uh, some information on food for the poor, but more importantly, the Word of God. Food for the poor's task is to take children that are starving, as you see here, and provide them with food and many other uh, things. And that comes to us from our Gospel lesson today. Jesus says very clearly that we are to reach out out of love to help those who are in need. In the, uh, the Gospel lesson begins with the words from Matthew where we have, when the Son of Man comes again in all of his glory, all the angels with him, he will then sit around that throne of glory. Wow, I'm looking forward to that, to being with Jesus in heaven one day, you know. I'm 83, so I'm older than any of you. Odds are I'll get there quicker than, than you will. Uh, but I'll send you a text as to what it's really uh, like in heaven. And we, of course, <laughs> wonder about that. I picture heaven not sitting on clouds playing the harp or something like that, but something like the, the uh, Garden of Eden restored. And the reason I happen to think that's how heaven might be like is because we remember when Jesus was crucified, he's on the cross, and you remember the two thieves, one on his left and one on his right, and the one said, well, if you're the Son of Man, come down and save yourself and us. And the other one said, we deserve what we're getting, but this man is innocent. And then he turns to Jesus and he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what was the response of Jesus? Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, when you hear that word paradise, you're thinking, oh, if I can only be in Florida on the beaches with all the palm trees, we picture heaven in that way, and we kind of use that term then. But we got to go a little deeper. The word paradise was a Persian word. Uh, 550 years or so before Jesus, the uh, Persians uh, had uh, con conquered that area, and it was the Babylonians before them, and the Babylonians deported the best and the brightest of the Jewish people to Babylon, modern-day Iraq, and then the Persians took over, and that's modern-day Iran. And through the several generations, you have some, those Persian words, many of them would learn the Persian language, and some of those words stayed within the Hebrew language, even to the time of Jesus. And when Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise, the word paradise, the Persian word, means garden. So what Jesus is really saying, today you will be with me in my garden. Regardless of what it is, we know that as those who follow and confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, He has promised us eternal life. And the Gospel goes on to say they'll all be gathered around the throne. Uh, there are people from every race and ethnic group, all who proclaim Jesus as, as Savior. And then we, uh, Jesus goes on to say, and He will separate the sheep from the goats. Why did he happen to use those two animals, and why the separation? Well, we just confessed that in the Apostles' Creed. He will come again to judge both the living and the dead. There will be a judgment uh, in heaven. And they have this separation. And he says it puts the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. And you're probably saying, big deal. What difference does it make if the sheep are in the pens on the right and the goats on the left? It makes a big difference big difference. You have to understand that in that culture, the right side was so prominent. And we have that also in the creed. We read, sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. So when he puts the sheep on the right, he is, he is selling, you know, this, these are the, the believers, those who are, who receive this eternal life, and the goats are, are on the, uh, the left. Now, we know then that Jesus then tells those on the right and they're wondering, wow, how were we so fortunate to be on the right side? And Jesus said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was sick, you came and visited me, etc. 
And the sheep are saying, wow, we don't remember you being hungry and giving you something to eat or being thirsty and, and bringing you something to drink. Well, it comes from the last words of the, uh, of the uh, gospel lesson where Jesus said, whatever you have done, to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done unto me. Now we still have to answer the question, why the sheep? You know, sheep are good, goats are good. Uh, how does he choose? And here's the answer to that. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. Goats just scatter all over. You got to herd them together. Right? You heard the expression, herding cats. That's what I like for goat. So the sheep follow. They follow the voice of the master. And so that, that's why Jesus then says the, the, these words, whatever you have done to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done unto me. We are called by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And as we begin this Lenten season, we are again vividly reminded of what God has done for us to send his only son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die for you and for me, that through faith in him and through his glorious resurrection, we have that hope and assurance of eternal life. What great love God has shown to us. And what is our response to that great love? Our response is to love God and to love one another. Yeah, we fall short of that. We don't always do that. We can get angry, we can get grouchy, complaining with our, even members of our, our family, etc. What that means is we sin daily and really deserve His punishment. But God loves us. Do you know there's nothing that you can do that would make God stop loving you? He loves you. He loves all of us. And He wants us in, around that heavenly throne one day. But while we here on earth, our response to that great love is to reach out and help those who are in need. And that's where food for the poor comes in. Food for the poor feeds about a million a day in 17 Latin American countries, primarily in the Caribbean uh, and Central America. There's uh, one country in South America. A million a day, five days a week. So you can see it, it's awesome. Uh, Food for the Poor is the eighth largest humanitarian organization in the United States. The United Way happens to be number one. But of those, Food for the Poor is by far the most efficient. Over 95% of the gifts given goes directly to help the poor. Only the Salvation Army comes close. They're at about 90%. So you have, here's some work of that food for the poor is involved in. It's much more than just feeding the poor, All of that's how it began 36 years ago. Look at the housing conditions. Children, you know, crammed together under a tarp. Uh, they're lucky, it looks like they're sleeping on a tarp. For many, it's just sleeping on a, a, the dirt floor, and when it rains, it's gonna get, it's gonna get wet, and there's gonna be mud. And if people want to get in out of the rain, so do the critters, the reptiles, and the rodents. So you're battling all that. They're just horrific conditions you can't even imagine. Or here in Jamaica, you see a lot of this. There's uh, this corrugated rusted metal on garbage uh, in garbage dumps, and so people try to make a home out of it. And as you can see, this is not going to keep uh, uh, a whole lot of uh, rain. Uh, this was a community in Haiti, as um, Missouri Senate Lutherans and all of the uh, speakers, there are about 90 speakers all together. But we're set on a mission trip every two years so we can come back and report what we have seen and uh, the work of Food for the Poor. This is in Haiti, it was a village of about 100 homes, just like this, made of bamboo sticks. But unfortunately, this single widow woman needs more help in getting uh, mud around the bamboo to keep out more of the rain. But as you can imagine, even though that home in the back there, you know, looks better and it is better, but with the heavy rains, you can picture that mud being washed off, so it's a continual maintenance uh, problem. And so all of the, the food for the poor set the goal to uh, uh, build a new home for each one of the villagers, and this was about four years ago, so it was completed uh, last year. But they tend to have large families, as you see here, a mother with, uh, with five children. It's part of the culture. 
Uh, people sometime in Bible class will ask me, well, why do they have so many children? Well, you got to understand the part of the culture and other conditions that are there. But I want you to look at these five children and especially notice the little girl in the center in the green dress. Take a look at the color of her hair. That's not the, nat the natural color of a Haitian. The natural color is the mother, the coal black hair. But you see her and her sisters uh, somewhat as well. But you see that in hundreds of thousands of children and it's a sure sign of malnutrition, of protein uh, deficiency. Uh, so, so to provide food, wholesome food for children like this and to provide them with a home is part of the work. Don't pay any attention to that man there. That's not his natural color here either. <laughs> but this is what the home looks like. There's cement blocks on a, uh, concrete blocks on a cement slab. These are Haitian workers. Uh, they're getting a salary, so they're earning a living. Food for the Poor only works through the churches. And the Lutheran speakers meet with our Lutheran leaders down there to see what their needs are so that food for the poor is sure to, uh, that they don't get lost anywhere and have their needs taken uh, care of. Uh, but the, the uh, churches decide who the next person is that gets the home. And usually single mothers are at the top of the list, families with a child with special needs, et, et cetera. Uh, this is what the home looks like when it's done. Not very big, only 800 square feet, no air conditioning. And of course, in the Caribbean and Central American countries, it's hot year-round, especially the summer. So you have two rooms. So it's not very big. If I said, hey, I got a free home for you here in uh, Jamaica, would you like it? You probably wouldn't. But I want to tell you this. Those people appreciate their homes more than any of us appreciate ours. If they are safe, they're dry, and when you, when you, you saw what kind of conditions they live in when they get a house like this, they are so thankful. If I could take you there when they hand them the keys to their house, they're just crying tears of joy to be able to have this uh, opportunity. But food continues to be uh, one of the primary needs. And it's so sad you go to these garbage dumps, you see children scampering up there uh, trying to find uh, uh, food or also they look for plastic bottles. There's a little bit of recycling uh, funding that's uh, available. Uh, but finding children like this, just skin and bones, and getting them into a, a feeding a program. Here's a feeding center in uh, Haiti. They come through, they feed 15,000 a day. They come in line here. You see the lady with the pink cap. She's got two buckets in front of her, one yellow and one white. Uh, with one bucket, it's filled with uh, rice and beans. That's the primary food. And then they go to another area, and that's a big black kettle pot where it's kind of like a stew. So this is for their family for the day, and they have to ration it out to have it for the weekends because the center is only open uh, five days a week. But the, the children have their schools then, and that becomes a high priority for food for the poor. The schools do three things. Provides an organized feeding program, breakfast and lunch five days a week. Of course, providing them an the education, and so many children do not have the opportunity to go to school there. So if they can learn to read and write and the other things, uh, maybe some of them might become business entrepreneurs. But the third reason, and the same reason why you support your school here, is they learn about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So they're getting the uh, spiritual food as well. Uh, here's one of the school that was built by a congregation in uh, Florida. Uh, about 15 years ago, Food for the, for the Board of Directors uh, said we got to help the people help themselves. And so they have uh, developed uh, fishing uh, farms here to or fish for food. And you know fish is a very high protein food. Or they have these uh, fishing villages of purchasing these 35 foot fiberglass boats replacing those rickety canoes. So they train the men how to take care of the motors. And on, on any uh, nice day, they can be out in the Gulf of Mexico fishing, uh, and uh, so we're bringing in a larger collection of, of fish and providing food for the uh, community. Uh, you know how peppers are a very important part of the diet of people in the Caribbean and Latin America, and perhaps for you as well. So pepper trees, and then uh, goat farms. A goat is a tremendous gift to provide for the, the, uh, the people. Do you know there are more people in the world that drink milk from goats than from uh, cows? Uh, all the 
Asians and Africa, and most of those countries is goat milk, and so a gift of a, a goat is just a, a blessing. And then they have chicken farms and pig farms, and so various ways to raise food. Next to food, water is the most critical. Here you see a mother bathing her child from water running down the muddy road. That's a rather common scene. So uh, diarrhea is such a problem there because they don't have the places to uh, get clean water. This is a, a very common scene to go to the nearest creek or river and of course you know how the water would be contaminated. So if they have a village of homes where they can get a well in, they'll provide that and then the people from the community can come and get the water that's fit to drink and to uh, cook with and for an extra gift they can get the water piped right into the uh, home. Uh, as I mentioned, schools a high priority. This was, you know, a common scene as well. Notice there's no electricity there, a dirt floor. Well, the only light they have is what comes through the slats in the doorway. Now these children are fortunate, they've got desks, at least most of them don't have that. Uh, but food for the poor builds schools. This is Martin Luther School in Guatemala. Uh, we have the largest number of Lutherans in that country and the, uh, the chairman, Ignacio Chan, uh, works with Food for the Poor, and they uh, built a uh, Martin Luther School, a very nice school, even by our standards. Otherwise, here's like New Testament uh, School. You can see how it's not going to keep out the rain, and there are no windows, and so light is a, a problem. And so, again, another church in uh, Florida built this preschool, ages uh, three to uh, six there. So again, the focus on schools, and I would pray maybe that your school here might, as, as one of their mission projects, uh, provide a gift that will buy desks or textbooks or, or things like that for them. You would be greatly blessed uh, to have that opportunity. So we come back to the words of Jesus. Whatever you've done to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you've done it unto me. In your uh, bulletin you have this brochure. I'll let you read that on your leisure. Just want to point out that uh, uh, inside there is a attached a envelope which tear, tears off, and you can see that uh, uh, already filled out the business address. The postage is paid. There will be an offering plate at, as you leave that you can put in your gift of cash or check or credit uh, card, or you can mail it in. I know that many of you don't bring your check with books with you, you can uh, uh, mail it in and that'll take care of it. I want to point out a number where my finger is. You will see that's 130441. Uh, that's the code for Good Shepherd here in East Troy. Out of the 90 speakers, there are probably 60 out today all over the country, but no one will have that code except uh, you. And it gives you, Pastor, uh, an opportunity to see you know, the gifts that uh, members of Good Shepherd have given. Also, if you are inclined to give a gift today, you may choose to, you may get a mailing and uh, may choose to give the gifts in the future. If you always put that number on your check, Good Shepherd will get the credit. Food for the Poor will get it either way. Also, if you want to designate a gift for like a, uh, a goat, $90, you have to indicate that on your check. Or a house is $3,600. I know that's a lot of money, and I probably shouldn't even uh, be suggesting it, but I pray maybe somebody might be able to provide that gift to build a house, or you as a congregation, uh, whatever you were able to do, be uh, greatly appreciated. And so we, uh, we focus on what God has commanded us to do, to love God, love one another, and we demonstrate our love when we reach out to those in need. So often in Scripture, Jesus mentioned about helping the poor, and you have that opportunity. However small or large your gift may be, God will bless you for it. And I thank you for this opportunity again, and may the peace and the love and the joy of God be and abide with you.